movement is our greatest ally, our strongest medicine, and I believe it also reveals our superpowers. Um, movement is a great way to get out of the chair. It gets our blood pumping. It helps us gain new perspective. And it turns out that movement is a great way to learn things, even something as complex as the history of the universe. Now, I know I'm just meeting most of you, but I have a confession to make. On the one hand, I am a groupaholic. For the past 18 years, I've traveled around the country working th with thousands of people, using movement as the medium for learning and for growth. Movement quickly activates somatic intelligence, and that somatic intelligence, you know, the, the intelligence of the body, exponentially increases in collaborative, engaged groups where there's no scoring. So I define somatic intelligence as the integration of the brain and the body in a state of conscious self-awareness. Somatic intelligence might be perceived as a curious alertness, a knowingness of where one's center of gravity is in time and space, a sustained ability to pay attention. Now, on the other hand, along the way, a friend introduced me to a lecture on cosmology. That one lecture lit a fire in my head so strong that it turned into a 10-year personal pursuit of the 13.8 billion year history of the universe and Earth. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I am a social scientist, a dancer, and evidently a total science geek. As I began reflecting on the cosmology I was learning, I started to discover patterns, perhaps the language the universe speaks in. These patterns turned out to be giant leap moments where the complexity and the creativity of the universe took a giant leap forward and then created the conditions for the next one. The universe seems to speak in the language of innovation, creativity, experimentation, mutation, failure, getting it wrong, perseverance. Yet ultimately, 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 the universe seems to repeatedly turn complexity and pot potential disaster into elegance. Solution, that's the sun, <laughs> and life-giving design. Now, I'm going to take us a tour through those leap moments. Scientists tell us that without the heat generated from the Big Bang, there would be no hydrogen or helium. Without helium, there are no stars or galaxies. Without stars or galaxies, there are no solar systems. Without nucleosynthesis in our solar system, so the red giants that explode and make trans-iron elements as they supernova, without nucleos nucleosynthesis in our solar system, there would be no Earth. Without Earth, there's no ocean. And without ocean, there's no salty brine for those single cells to emerge. And without single cells, my friends, there is no you. <laughs> There is no me, and there is no TED Talks. <laughs> so one night in Boulder, Colorado, these two aspects of myself collided. I was teaching a movement class, and the science geek in me erupted onto the scene. And I began guiding my students in the journey life had been through, from the ocean onto land. After class, my students were all abuzz. They wanted me to know what had happened. They reported that the history of life went from a distant, faraway, somewhat irrelevant concept to something they literally felt connected to, included in, and excited about. And you know what happened for me, right? 
Did I just discover the secret formula for creating more science geeks? <laughs> I wanted to know what happened, so I made a decision that night. I thought, if in one night my students went from concept to living felt experience, what would happen if we went through each of these giant leap moments in the 13.8 billion year history of the universe using movement as the medium for deeper understanding? That night I made a decision and two, two of my dear friends and I called a small group of people together and we, got, we met in a, a dance studio and we began bringing these two distinctive worlds together. There was a lot of talk in my circle of friends and colleagues at that time about our growing ecological planetary pickle. <laughs> You know the one, you know the story, rising greenhouse gases, loss of species and their habitats, overpopulation, some even saying we are racing our own extinction. But wait, the science geek in me had heard this story before. It sounded a lot like one of those threshold moments, one of those leap moments in the 13.8 billion year story that is equally marked by trial as it is by potential. And my mind went to those first single cells, you know the ones, the ones who invented photosynthesis. Yet in the process they created so much oxygen it was literally killing them. But obviously they made it through their pickle. <laughs> How? <laughs> I stumbled upon a quote by Albert Einstein that confirmed my intuition. He said, we cannot solve our problems from the same level of thinking that created them. So what kind of thinking is needed? How does the universe think? And what did those first cells rely on to find the solutions they needed to keep life going? Have you ever met anyone with a 13.8 billion year track record of success and innovation? Look to your left and look to your right. Now you have. I mean, think about it. The human body is made of 76 trillion cells, each of those cells coursing with a life that has literally been maturing for billions and billions of years. And no matter how we try and squirm out of it, we too are connected to that legacy. So I thought, I want to learn to think like that. Let's become giant leap thinkers. So I called deep on my experience with groups as living systems. I added in my passion and my respect for movement and dance and I heavily sprinkled in the 13.8 billion year science as best I understood it. It started out as a 15 month prototype in Boulder, Colorado and has since become a nonprofit project that houses a non-formal movement based science curriculum of the 13.8 billion year history as well as a stage production I've written and perform. For the last four years, I've traveled around the country offering this method to thousands of people in cultural centers, schools, uh, community centers, museums, universities, colleges. Whoop. So, do you wanna see how this plays out in the real world? Awesome, so as our volunteers come forward, what we're gonna do is, um, and if the house lights can come up a little, that would be awesome. Um, Oops, okay. Um, we're gonna take a brief, um, we're gonna leap back in time. So let's see a show of hands of the people who remember a time before the cell phone. Okay, cool. Um, before we landed on the moon. Before the light bulb. <laughs> the automobile. The printing press. Right, before we domesticated the seed and created agriculture. Before we discovered fire before the first hominins became bipedal, before the first warm-blooded mammals, before the dinosaurs, the reptiles, the amphibians. Now we're back in the ancient sea where the bone, the lung, the muscle, the eyeball were invented. Let's zoom back 550 million years ago to the Cambrian explosion. 
Before that, we had snowball earth. And now we are 3.9, 3.5 billion years in the past. So please take 10 seconds and bring to mind everything you think you know about photosynthesis. Begin moving. You are single cells in the primordial sea. The ocean is recently formed and there are still clouds. It's a bit stormy. And your primary source of food single cells, even though you don't have eyes, you don't have hands, you don't have a spinal cord yet, your primary source of food is hydrogen. Now, we are all in this moment of imagining, trying to imagine what it was like way back then. The, this radiant, warm sunlight trickles down through the atmosphere into the ocean water, and you cannot help but want to commune with it. So you start shaping your body in all different ways, trying to catch <laughs> the sunlight. <laughs> and then eventually, one of you succeeds. Ooh, here it is. <laughs> now, there's no World Wide Web yet, and there's no Google yet, but this knowledge spread throughout the ocean and all of the cells began photosynthesizing the sun. <laughs> keep moving, keep moving. Now, what happens in the belly of the cell when the, the photon is caught, the photon travels 186,000 miles a second, right? So the water molecule in the belly of the cell gets divided and the hydrogen bonds with the CO2 creating Sugar! And for the first time on Earth, sugar happens. Now we know this the, other, this, the oxygen that got split open in the water molecule now gets released. And these single cells are releasing oxygen. Now as the technology of photosynthesis spread through the ocean, more and more oxygen gets released. Yes, yes, yes. That oxygen begins to saturate the ocean water over time. That oxygen then saturates the atmosphere as well. And as we know, any, too much of any good thing eventually becomes toxic. So the environment was toxic there were some organ organis there were some cells that didn't do anything to adapt. Some of them didn't didn't respond at all. And they perished. And we know they died because of the carbon records. Now there was another response. You're doing great, by the way. You're doing great. It's just this is awesome. Now, the other response was that some of the cells tried to get away from this toxic, lethal substance, and they swam deeper <laughs> and deeper into the deeper layers of the ocean, into the strata. And we know that because they're still there, and they haven't evolved. And we weren't sure. Life was on the brink. Was life going to continue? Okay, so we need half the group over here and then half the group over here, okay. Now, we weren't sure, was life gonna continue? Okay, so you are the ancient ones of the ocean, yes. And your particular strength is being a strong cell wall. You know what to keep out and what to keep in, so let yourself embody that. Now you, over here, you are the new ones on the scene. That's right. You are the innovators, come out of the, yes, there are no corners in the ocean, okay. So, yes, and come together. Now, you know what to do with this oxygen. You know how to take it in and turn it into fuel. So work together at creating this amazing new invention that life created. Beautiful. Okay, awesome. 
You are so intelligent. You've been around a long time. You know what to keep in, what to let out. Yes. Okay, so you're taking the oxygen, you're turning it into fuel, you are so awesome. And I just have to tell you, you're also new to the ocean. And so, you know, you might need a little more protection, some warmth, and they have something that you need, and you have something they need. Okay, so I know you guys are just amazing at this process. And (laughs) if you don't figure out what to do with this oxygen, it's over. But they have something that you need. (laughs) So you're sharing your skills, you're learning from each other, you're collaborating. Beautiful. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yes. And pause. Okay. Great. So, so what would it mean to embody this level of participation and human engagement in our schools and in our businesses? So we could have talked about it using this paragraph, right? We could all be sitting at desks reading a textbook. We know that approach to learning. Or we could embody what we're learning. And what's standing in the way? (laughs) Chair, worldview, okay. So I'd like to close with, um, with a question and an invitation. So what billion year solution are you, your family, your colleagues, your classroom, your city council, your community? What billion-year solution are you sitting on? And I want to invite each and every one of us to consider your solution as a potential creative link, a bridge, a giant leap into the viable future that is standing luminously on the event horizon, inviting us to claim it. Thank you.